Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Uh, this is Jane Patterson. Uh, Sam already has her screen shared, so you're not going to see my face, which is fine. But welcome to everyone. Um, welcome everyone to our first program of this fall and our program season, which runs through the fall and the spring. We take a little hiatus in the summer. Um, and we're very glad to be back and glad to have Samantha Rutledge here uh, to speak to us about bird color. And I'll let Sam introduce herself. All right. And I'm now unmuted. I think I'm going out of several minutes. All right. Okay. No, no, no echo. Um, hi, all. I'm Sam Rutledge. I am a third year, starting my third year, PhD student at the Mason Lab in the Museum of Natural Science. At um, and today I'm going to talk to you about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, color is something my friends, colleagues, my advisor. Um, if anyone's taken a tour with me, you know, I can talk for hours probably on color alone in birds. Fascinating topic. And today I have a captive audience. So they're stuck with me to talk. So, but today we're going to touch on the mechanisms that generate avian color, as well as the roles it plays in the wild. Um, but just to start, I want to take a moment. Uh, I think it will work. No, no, just give me a moment. Technical difficulties. There we go. Okay. So I just want to take a moment to first of course appreciate how colorful birds are, right? Uh, they're among some of the world's most color diverse taxa out there. Almost every shade you can imagine is probably found in the bird. And for many of us, it's color that draws our attention to the world of birds in the first place. Uh, many of us have spark birds or cook birds, depending on your bird terminology, a bird that essentially gets us interested in birding in the first place. And for me, that was the starlet manager. I still remember that. I was out for a walk, you know, in the Pennsylvania woodlands. I happened to look up and see this blotch of red in the tree above me. And at first, I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe it was garbage that I got caught up in there. You know, the world we live in, right? Um, or maybe it was a cardinal, because I did know what cardinal was. But I looked at that bird, and I had no clue what it was. The next day, I signed up my first bird guide. It was actually an autumn bird to be um, and ever since I've been hooked on the world of birds, which ultimately led me out to the bird habit of hunting. Quite a drastic change in my life. Um, but before we dive into the birds themselves and their color, I want to take a moment to actually ask what is color itself? So this might seem like kind of a bizarre question with an intuitive answer, right? Like, what do you mean when color? color is green, brown, purple, beige, green, things are colorful. And that is correct, but it's also incorrect, depending on what aspect of color you're talking about and what kinds of questions you're trying to answer with it. For instance, color can be considered an objective physical property that has nothing to do with how we perceive it. And that is what most of us color scientists measure in birds. What you're seeing here is an objective measurement of color that is taken with um, what we call spectrophotometers. And it allows us to compare color patches across avian groups without a society's objective 
starting with just purple, blue, or green. If you've ever had an argument with someone over whether something is pink or magenta, you know, it can be a very subjective. This allows us to objectively look at color in the biological sense. However, the subjective side of color is just as important and is what most of us think about in terms of what color is. It's also what a lot of words are So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But um, the subjective experience of color, first of all, starting with your light source, such as the sun or the room lights, whatever it is, your light source emits a beam of light that hits a color patch of some sort of material, whether that's on the bird or something. Um, the patch in question, depending on the material, then reflects that patch to the surrounding medium, often the air, but sometimes the water. Can you hear me? My microphone's not the best here. We'll try our best to stay right here. Uh, direct me back if I move. Um, but okay, so color is reflected off the patch through the surrounding medium, which can affect its, uh, how much of it reaches the viewing system of the receiver. Whether that's a bird or a human, the visual system is then stimulated by this incoming light, thus causing the perception of color, such as you know, forming these patches on this hummingbird. And the reason I bring up the visual system is because that differs from creature to creature and even within um, you know, individuals in a species, right? Um, some humans are colorblind, for example. Birds have a different visual system from humans and this can all affect how color is perceived and what ultimately is being generated by the brain. And just to give us an example of that, um, many of us know humans are considered trichromats. That is, we have um, sort of three colors to play with that generate all the combinations we can see in nature. That is based on what we call cone sensitivities in our eyes. We have three kinds of cones. Based on how the light stimulates them, it generates the rainbow that we see um, in everything. All the colors we could possibly imagine are generated by three cone types only. This affects how we perceive color. We're only able to see in this visual spectrum. We can't see into the ultraviolet. We can't see into the near infrared. Birds, however, have an extra cone type. Thus, they can actually see into the ultraviolet light, and this affects how they perceive color. They have a completely new um, element that's impacting how they perceive color in the world around them. Um, and this can have quite a drastic, dramatic um, effect on what is being perceived. So, for example, here's a picture of a bird based on human vision. It doesn't look terribly colorful, you know, two, maybe three colors going on there. Here's the same bird, but viewed maybe in the eyes of a bird. And just a caveat, this is a false colored image. We can't actually see ultraviolet light. We can't actually make colors that are ultraviolet, but here's just distinguishing where some patches are ultraviolet versus others. So to the bird's eye, this is a very colorful bird. There's a lot going on. And the reason I bring this up is I just want you to keep that in mind as we start talking about the roles that color plays in bird biology. What the birds are seeing is going to be different from what we're seeing. Um, so yeah. It's pretty cool. It's a fun fact you can throw out at parties. Uh, you know, birds seem to be ultraviolet. It's pretty fascinating to think about. All right. So now let's actually start talking about the roles of color in bird biology. And one of the first ones most people think of is the role of color in courtship, right? You think of birds, you know, flaunting their colors to try and attract mates. Whether that's through showing off specific patches, such as in this uh, Costas hummingbird here or in this golden pheasant just rolling that color, uh, colored patch. Maybe in the rifle bird, this is a bird of paradise, a very crazy colorful group, They've got some amazing uh, courtship rituals. Or maybe they'll use dance to express their colors, such as in this uh, red cap mannequin. I um, highly encourage that you look up the moonwalking mannequin video. There's a great Michael Jackson accompaniment to this mannequin dancing and showing off its colors, but it's quite fun. <laughs> Um, all this to say that feathers are not the only thing that cause um, color and aren't the only thing used in courtship, right? Skin is also very colorful in birds, such as this frigate bird is demonstrated by inflating this nice red cooler patch. Um, but also tragopans are quite spectacular. This is the tragopan inflating that skin patch in front, as well as two little additional sky blue horns on either side, um, all used for courtship and quite fascinating to see. The other major role of bird color that a lot of us think about and are familiar with is its role in camouflage. And as birders, you probably appreciate this one in particular. If you've ever tried to find an owl in broad daylight, it can be quite tricky, especially when they blend in so well against the bark. Um, a lot of nestlings are also colored to match their nesting substrate. Golden plover chicks have been kind of a media sensation lately. If you're on Twitter, there have been a bunch of photos floating around. 
Um, but these guys are very well designed color wise to blend into their surrounding environment and prevent uh, being eaten before they're too much bigger. Uh, snipes, if you've ever tried finding a Wilson snipe and you're looking right at it and you still can't see it, don't feel too bad about it. They're great at blending into their environment um, as this image clearly demonstrates. Uh, lots of green birds are also really good at blending into the surrounding background. A lot of us will look at a green bird um, and be like, that's such a bright green. How would I not see that in the forest? Well, a lot of tropical birds in particular use this to their advantage because it actually is surprisingly hard to spot a green bird against a green canopy, right? Um, and similar colors that you might think would be eye popping otherwise is the color white as exhibited by this willow ptarmigan, for example. This white color enables it to blend into its snowy background. And this is also a cool example of a bird that will change its color with the season. In the summer season, this will have more of a brown morph as the snow melts around it. Um, so color is used in camouflage a lot and it's used very effectively. Now to get into maybe some less well-known roles of coloration in birds, uh, the first being it's used as a signal to sort of um, signal where the bird stands in its hierarchy in a flock. Like where does it rank on the totem pole, how dominant or submissive it is. In common wax bills, it's been demonstrated that the, the saturation of the red chest feathers indicates how dominant that bird is in the flock. Um, similar things happen with the sociable weaver. It's the extent and saturation of the black bib that indicates where that ranks in the social hierarchy. The more close to home example is in house sparrows. The extent and saturation of that black bib indicates whether that bird is more submissive in its, um, to its colleagues. And then yet another example, and by no means is this list exhaustive. There's a ton of examples out there, but as in golden crown sparrows, um, it's been shown that the extent and saturation of the yellow in the crown indicates where that bird ranks in its social hierarchy, oftentimes for life. And the idea behind um, this being important for these flocking species is that by indicating where they rank socially based on visual cues, they don't have to waste a lot of energy duking it out every time it comes to accessing food, which does enable them to, um, you know, direct energy towards more fruitful pursuits, such as eating food, flying around, finding a mate. Um, so in this case, structure, or not structure, color forms a very important role. All right, another fun um, role for color that maybe we think about in other creatures, but not in birds, is through the use of the startle or maybe deception um, outside of the realm of camouflage. And what I mean by that is the use of eye spots. So a lot of pygmy owls um, have these eyes. When I was first looking at photos of these, I first was like, I'm just seeing a bunch of owls with this thing. And they're like, I don't know well, where's the eye spots. And then I looked closer and then it said, no, actually not. Um, it's shown up, it shows up in a few other owl species, such as the northern hawk owl. It's a little less dramatic in this photo, but it also shows up in some falcons, such as the American kestrel. It's got more of a face on the back of its head and even take a falcon in Africa, too. Um, and there's fairly not fully known why they have these eye spots, but one cool idea out there is that a lot of these birds get mobbed by little passerines during the daylight in particular. The idea here is that the face on the back of its head um, prevents the you know, them getting bombarded back in the school by chickadees. So they're less likely to go for the face. So potentially the eye spots in the faces are there to prevent brain damage in the event of being mobbed by the little out to get them. All right. So we've talked about color in the sense of it being visually important in these birds' um, biology. Now we're going to get more into the side, the objective side of color, where maybe the function of it is for the visual side of things, but more so for the physical properties it has. Um, with one example being thermoregulation, some colors may be more advantageous environments based on their ability to absorb or reflect more solar radiation uh, than other kinds of colors. And solar radiation is just you know, ultraviolet, visible, and near infrared light, basically what happens in sunlight. So some colors are better at reflecting it than others. Um, and this is a really kind of a new area of looking at bird color. There's still a lot of work going on here. We're still figuring out which species might have this role going on. Um, a relatively really recent paper uh, showed that, you know, sunbirds, for instance, might have better capabilities at retaining heat if they have more so, Whether or not this is useful for them still remains to be seen, but it might play a role in helping them thermoregulate in their environments. It's also been shown in some species that have both light and dark morphs, that dark morphs absorb more solar radiation than the lighter species, which if you're in a cold environment, that would probably be a benefit. But if you're in a um, warmer environment, that might not be as beneficial in that case, right? So it all impacts their ability to thermoregulate. 
Um, and again, it's not just feathers that do this. Skin is another major thing. A lot of mouse birds, for example, have jet black skin. They're often seen turning that skin and exposing it towards the sun, maybe to help with thermal regulation. Um, but still a lot of work to be done in this area. This is pretty speculative for the most part. Um, along the same vein is the idea that uh, certain colors might be protective against UV radiation. Uh, as many of you may know, UV radiation is highly damaging to cells and cause mutations and it can even ultimately result in cancer. So it's no different for birds. And when you consider a lot of these birds live in very um, UV high environments, especially uh, species like vulture and guinea fowl, African jacanas uh, and green bulls. Now, these all have jet black skin, and there's recently been a study that has shown that a lot of birds with jet black skin also live in highly um, UV high environments. So there may be a role for this um, kind of color protecting their overall body from extreme UV radiation. You know, give it a couple of years, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, more species here in Louisiana with jet black skin based on the high UV levels we've been having here, especially, right? Um, okay. And the last thing I want to end with in terms of roles of avian coloration um, is that the coloration occurring in eggs, right? Eggs are almost just as colored as species themselves in many cases. And we're still learning a lot about the different roles egg coloration plays. There's still a lot that we don't know. Um, but one of the major roles that is pretty obvious in some species is its role in camouflage. They're very good at blending into their nesting substrate and preventing uh, predators from finding them. Another uh, potential role for egg colors is in brood parasitism. Um, brood parasites are species that lay their eggs in the nests of host species, thus basically dumping all parental care in that species and never raise their own young. A good example of that being brown-headed cowbirds, uh, very brood parasitic, and can be very damaging to the host species in general. So it's important um, or to the host's advantage to be able to identify that parasitic egg and eject it out of the nest before um, it can hatch in the first place. Some hosts are better at this than others, but as well as the ones that are good at it are able to identify their own eggs, perhaps based on an eggshell signature that comes from the pattern of the colors of their own eggs, enabling them to um, get rid of the foreign egg without accidentally ejecting. Now, these are just a couple of roles that we know about, but there's still so many bizarre egg colors out there that we really don't know what's going on with them. A classic example being Tinamu eggs, which basically look like Easter eggs. They're bright and shiny. Um, not very good at camouflage. There's so, but there's a couple of ideas being bounced around about why they might be so colorful. And a recent study had the idea that perhaps it's useful for species recognition during the nesting period. In order for that to make sense, um, you have to understand how the Tinamu's uh, breeding system works. Males build a nest that multiple females come and lay their eggs in. So it's thought that maybe when the, email, the female is trying to figure out which nest to lay her egg and she's looking for a specific color that matches her species. It's still just one idea. There's been one paper that maybe has shown some support for it, but we're still figuring out a lot about what's going on with these crazy colors, um, which is part of the fun of doing color research as this presentation will make clear. Um, okay, so now we've talked about the roles of color in bird biology. Let's start diving into the mechanisms. Um, and this is more so along the lines of what I do for my research as I'll explain later on. Um, but just to start as a brief overview, this is a fun introductory diagram to uh, mechanisms of avian color. It's not perfect by any means, but looking at this, you might be like, well, there's at least six different ways to generate color. However, if you look closer, there's really only two broad categories here. The first one being pigments. All of these are just different kinds of pigments, and they all operate in the same way, as I'll go over in the next slides, um, with the other major category being structural color. Structural color is also an area that has a ton of research going on right now. It's really only uh, relatively recently that we've started to look at this in depth, but we've already just started to discover some really cool things about it as I'll go over um, later on. But we'll start with pigments. Okay, so pigments are molecules that selectively absorb some way of color to reflect others. A good example of this being uh, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a green pigment that occurs in leaves and plants in general. And what happens is sunlight arrives at that leaf, hits the chlorophyll, the chlorophyll absorbs all the colors in the sun except for the color green, and then reflect the green light into the eyes of the viewer, making us perceive that color. 
same thing happens in bird feathers. This is a cool diagram. If you've ever done the Cornell Bird Academy color seminar series, they have a bunch of excellent diagrams here, this being one of them. Um, but essentially, sun is hidden the pigment in this bird's feathers. All the wavelengths are being absorbed except for the red wavelengths. The red wavelengths reflected, causing us to perceive this cardinal as red. Um, and there's a bunch of different pigments out there. We're still categorizing more. There's always seems to be another pigment that pops up. There's so many of them. Uh, but we'll start with some of the more common ones that are found in birds. First one being carotenoids. Now, carotenoids are pretty unique in pigments themselves, as being that they have to be obtained from the bird's diet. The bird doesn't eat carotenoids in its diet. It cannot generate its colors. Um, and once it enters the bird's body, it can then be uh, deposited directly in the feathers, or it can be further modified by the bird's physiological systems to generate still other colors. So, you know, one species might eat, you know, carotenoid rich food and turn yellow, while the other might turn red, all based on how those uh, pigments are being modified and eventually deposited in the feathers later on. Um, this is a very simplified version of how this works. There's a ton of pathways that go on, there are a ton of elements that interplay to make this happen. But this is the general idea. And carotenoids are responsible for most of your oranges, yellows, reds, and even pinks in birds. Most of the time when you see these colors, they're based on carotenoids, with a few exceptions that I'll highlight that are pretty cool. All right, yeah, let's drink some water. <clears throat> the next major category of pigments in birds is melanin. Specifically, there's two kinds of melanin, melanin and eumelanin, and they almost always occur together in birds. It's dependent and sorry, it's the ratio of theomelanin to eumelanin that matters in generating the colors that you ultimately see. If you have more eumelanin than theomelanin, you're more likely to get darker grays and blacks. Um, and as the theomelanin ratio, you start to get more browns and tan, and then ultimately more russet browns and even oranges, right? Sort of a brown orange color going on in this robin is all based on melanin which is a bit counterintuitive. A lot of people think it's the carotenoids in this bird's diet, but it's really more the melanin that's occurring here. Okay, so carotenoids, melanin, big major pigment classes in birds. But now we're gonna talk about some ones that are pretty unique to certain families. The first one being cetacofulvins. Now, cetacofulvins are unique to parrots. They're found in no other group of birds as far as we know. And in all three families of parrots, you know, whether they're old world or new world, they all have these pigments, so it's very well conserved. Um, and they're just responsible for generating the yellows you see in parrots, the reds, and the oranges. So unlike birds that need to obtain these pigments from their diet, parrots can generate them regardless of what they're eating. There's a couple of ideas bouncing around that cetacofulins will have other properties that make them present in birds. Maybe they help prevent feather degradation in very tropical environments where there's a lot of microbes eating things. Um, but we're still figuring out why this is so well conserved versus more common carotenoid coloration. Another family unique uh, pigment is a pretty cool class called Tarakoverdin. Um, <coughs> as I'll explain later, green is a weird color in birds. It's generally not based on pigments. A lot of plants have green pigments, but it's very rare in birds. Um, with the exception via in Tarakos. They are probably the only bird uh, group out there that has a true green pigment in their feathers. Tracoverdin. Um, and some tracoverdins are also responsible for some of the pink you see in this group as well, too. So very cool group of birds, very interesting uh, pigment going on here. It's based on copper that they get from their diets. This at least is the leading theory. Um, but very, very fascinating. Now for another family of pigment. And if you're with me on the Noah Striker tour, I briefly mentioned this. And Um, it's spendicin and it's responsible for generating the yellows in your penguins. So the feathers are being hidden in the yellow, the yellow in the eyes or the caps, or even in the belly areas. It's all generated via spendicin. So similar to carrots, they do not need to obtain carotenoids from their diet to generate this yellow color. Um, this aberrant pink penguin is just really cool to show. It's just this pe this penguin lacks all other pigments. Except for that spendicin, so you can see the full extent that is deposited in the feathers. Um, and really, really cool class of birds right here for many other reasons too. Okay, next up, we're gonna talk about another pigment that is not specific to a family, but it is still rather unique in where it shows up, and that is porphyrins. 
Um, Provirons, um, by the note themselves, don't look all that special. They show up in a lot of owls and night guards in particular. Looks kind of like melon, brown, rusted brown, nothing special, at least under normal light. If you look at it under UV, it turns fluorescent pink. And we're still not sure why this is important. Again, the fact that it shows up in a lot of nocturnal species might indicate why this fluorescence is beneficial in that kind of environment. But the jury is still out, so stay tuned on why this is happening. But if you ever get the opportunity to look at owl wings under UV light, take it. It's a really cool experience to have. Okay. And similar to how I ended the, the roles of the color in biology, I'm going to end also on eggs here, specifically talking about eggshell pigments. For the longest time, we thought there were only two eggshell pigments out there, uh, biliverdin, responsible for any of your blue or greenish eggs, or protofirin, which generates your browns, grays, and black eggshells. However, once again, tinamous are weird. Um, they have their own unique eggshell pigments, and this has only been recently shown. So based on the fact that we found two, at least two new pigments within the eggshells of tinamous has started to lead a lot of other scientists looking at other eggshells to see if there's any pigments that we missed. So there may be way more pigments than we think in eggshells and it's pretty fascinating to see what their properties will be in the future. Okay, we've talked about pigmentation, but now we're gonna talk about how color is generated via structures in birds. And when I'm talking about structure, I'm talking about feather structure. Many of you are familiar with feathers, right? They're, they have a central shaft or a rachis surrounded on all sides by a vein that is composed of barbs. This is what we call feather macrostructure. It's on the, the larger level. If you zoom in, you'll start to see that the barbs have little individual barbules that come off of them. Um, when we come down to this level, we refer to the barbules and barbs as microstructures because we consider this level the microstructural level. If you zoom in still further, now you're getting down to the cellular level or the nano. And we refer to the cells we see down here and their specific arrangements as nanostructures. All of these structures um, are basically the key drivers of structural color in birds, as I'll explain in the next few slides. But you may be wondering how the different arrangements and different shapes actually generates this color in the first place. In order to answer that question, we do have to stray into the world of physics, which I am an odd biologist that actually enjoys this. But I'll keep it brief. The two main things that you'll need to understand here, and I'll go over them in much more detail in the next slide, are the idea that the nanostructures I mentioned in the previous slide have specific arrangements, specific arrangements that allow them to cause this phenomenon called scattering, which ultimately generates the colors you see. Let's start with the specific arrangements. So <clears throat> the nanostructures of the little cells within a bird's feather can be arranged on what we call a, sort of a continuum of order. Um, they can be completely disordered, randomly scattered around in that barb or barbule, um, or they can be much, much more ordered um, on the level where they're very, very specific where they are in that feather. And the difference between this order really has a huge impact on what colors are generated based on its effect on the phenomenon of scattering. Scattering is just when light hits the particles within the structure, it gets bounced all around and re-emitted at a specific wavelength, with well, that wavelength being what is ultimately perceived by whoever is looking at it. Um, and based on the arrangements of these structures, uh, you'll have different kinds of scattering. If you have a very ordered uh, nanostructural arrangement, you'll get what's called coherent scattering. The wavelengths that are re-emitted are re-emitted in a very specific way. That allows them to sort of build on top of each other and reinforce each other, which allows you to generate really brilliant colors, right? Because they keep building on top of each other. You'll get very bright blues, purples, um, and lots more, as you'll see in a second. This is as opposed to incoherent structure, or what I like to think as color chaos, which is when things are readmitted randomly with no rhyme or reason. And because they're so random, they often pull each other out, generating very dull colors or often just white color. Okay, two big important things though to take out both of those slides is that nanostructures and feathers are arranged in specific patterns that cause scattering to occur in a specific with that specific shape and the color that you see. Now we're going to talk about the different colors that are generated via these processes. The first one being white. Um, as I alluded to, white is generated via color chaos for the most part, very disordered nanostructural arrangements that cause incoherent scattering. Despite um, 
being kind of chaotic and you know not very colorful in of itself white is still very um well employed in the bird world as many of us know or that's just some very bright wing patches such as in the northern mockingbird maybe the head of a bellbird or maybe the entire bird itself as you'll see in my canary snowy leader come around here um bali mina is another spectacularly white bird um, or even just snow bunnies white is everywhere in the bird world um up higher in the level of order, once things start to get a little bit more ordered, but still are pretty random for the most part, um, or as we like to call it, quasi ordered, we start to get more coherent scattering, so more, you know, less random scattering. And this allows you to generate more saturated colors, such as blue, purple, and ultraviolet, um, which enables us to see, you know, brilliant blue colors, such as this small blue kingfisher, um, or maybe this, you know, little penguin, which is the only penguin that we know that has blue colors in it. Really, really cool. Um, or maybe the purple in this uh, purple crown pyramid. All of this is based entirely on light. There's no pigments to light. It's all an optical illusion, as I like to tell people. Also, ultraviolet color, right? So again, these are false. The, the image on the left is a false colored image. But this is some of the work that has happened at the museum. This was done by an undergraduate in my lab last, yes, last year already. Wow. Um, he was looking at birds under UV cameras. The, one, the, the image on the right is showing us just like what it looks like normally. This is bl a blue Xenodactus uh, Reno, or Xenodactus, depending um, on your common name. And it just looks, you know, blue, nothing too special going on. But if you look at that same bird under UV light, um, and it doesn't show up as dramatically here, but you'll notice in the throat feathers in particular, the um, patches are showing up white, look very faintly. That is UV reflection. So to the bird's eye, there is some UV patterning going on. And it's not just blue at the front area. Again, though, all of these colors are caused um, by still pretty disordered nanostructures, but there's coherent scatter going on across the Now we're going to talk about my favorite color, um, no bias at all, um, is the that, that is, uh, iridescent coloration. And this is what I studied in my dissertation. So I will try not to go too heavy on it, but feel free to ask me later if you want to get off. I'll be happy to do so. Um, but iridescence is the color phenomenon um, when a patch of color changes depending on which angle it is viewed at. One angle, the same color patch will look green versus at another angle, it'll look blue or purple, depending on which angle you're at. It's all the same patch, it's all the same structures, the bird's not changing anything. It just depends on which way the light is hitting it and which way you're viewing it from. And this is a fun video to just demonstrate this. This is a Lampertornis nitens, a kitty you know, notice as I turn it in the light, it's going to convert a teal color to a bit of green there. There are some purple highlights too, white, purple, bronze. And this is all just because I'm seeing it. Let us zoom in. Again, no pigments to light in this structure. Um, specifically, all very highly ordered or crystalline nanostructures. Iridescent is a very ordered So, very specific coherent scatter. And it shows up in a lot of places. Um, a lot of people might not recognize it immediately because some, some angles are so black. One group of birds that most people have seen iridescence in, at least, is in hummingbirds. Almost all of their subspecies of this family have some level of iridescence, and some are like very high. Um, that's just the unique perception. This is one of the lesser species that you've ever seen. It's the more spectacular ones in the tropics. They're just in reflections. They're rainbows, rainbows of color. Um, another closer to home example, though, to like witness iridescence is maybe in a species we don't like very much, but if you see it in the right lighting, it is quite beautiful. The European starlin. If you yeah. see one of these birds initially, you think, oh, that's just a black drab bird. Get it away from my feeders. I don't like it, which fair, they're an invasive species. <laughs> um, but if you have the opportunity to see one of these in a beam of sunlight or just the right angle, they are a rainbow of colors. Um, and almost all starling species are like this. And the hundred and some ones that I'm studying, especially the African species are incredibly iridescent. There's a lot of eye popping rainbows going on there. Another um, species here in North America that a lot of people don't think about as iridescent, but in fact, is almost completely iridescent in its plumage is the wild turkey. These are almost all covered in iridescent color, including the females, although theirs is a little bit less than the males. Um, and it's actually thought that one way to differentiate between the different subspecies of wild turkey might be the degree of iridescence that each one is uh, showing. 
Iridescence is a bizarre color phenomenon. We're still figuring out a lot about why it exists in birds because in you know a lot of cases, both the males and the females have it, making it maybe not as useful for courtship if both of them are showing it. Um, but that's a whole nother presentation, maybe my dissertation defense. So <laughs> if you're very curious, stay tuned for the next three years, um, what I find. <laughs> okay. Now we've talked about um, pigmentation and structure, but you'll notice I left out a major color and that's green. One of the reasons is that is because green is what we call a combination color. And side note, I did not, um, this is not a coined term to refer to these colors, it's just how I think of them. Combination colors are colors that combine structure and pigment to get a unique color blend. So similar to mixing together blue and yellow, if you combine, uh, structural blue and a yellow pigment, you'll often get some very brilliant greens in nature, such as this glistening green tanager here. Um, but another uh, combination color that's kind of gaining in the um, fame recently, especially, because I did hear someone in the audience mention it earlier, so I know people are starting to hear about it, and that is ultra black. Ultra black is considered a combination color because it combines feather structure with melanin to get a very, very deep and highly absorbing black color. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this phenomenon, it's the blackest black you could possibly imagine in nature. Super absorbing, looks very different from a regular black patch. Um, and there's still a lot of ideas on what it's used for. A big popular one being uh, um, its use in courtship as a very contrasting patch to otherwise brilliant colors. You'll find in a lot of birds of paradise, some mannequin species. Um, but there's also the idea bouncing around that it might be helpful for thermoregulation as well, given that it absorbs a lot of solar radiation in that black patch. Another more recently discovered combination color is considered um, still pretty mysterious for the most part. We only know about a couple of species, but there may be more examples of it out there. And that is the color we call red velvet. So far, it's been shown mainly in some tanager species, but this is a reddish color that they noticed um, didn't seem quite right for just a pigment-based color. And upon closer examination, they found that feather structures were in fact interplaying with the carotenoid pigment involved to generate this very sleek, shiny, unique red velvety color. Um, however, this is not the only example of feather structure interacting with a carotenoid to generate an interesting color combination. In fact, it's thought that the pinks and purples in most kingfishers are also generated via a combination of color and structure. As for the actual um, Pigments involved, that is still something that's much in the works. We're not entirely sure specifically which pigments are always involved in this. We just know that there is an element of both going on here. So hopefully there'll be some more work on this in the future. And yeah, pink fishers are cool for many reasons, but this is a fascinating one. Okay. Now the last thing I want to touch on in terms of color formation um, is a very understudied realm of avian color. There's really not been a ton of work except for recent years. Good um, but that is avian eye color. Now, this is a figure that many may have seen. Um, I think it was in a news article, but this is uh, based on a work done by Eamon Horvath at the Museum of Natural Science. He is one of our students. He was also looking at avian eye color as part of his research. The reason I bring it up after combination colors, though, is that it's thought that a lot of the color in the eyes, such as maybe the golds here or the blues, are all basically an interplay of pigments and perhaps some structural elements going on in there. Some of these eye colors may be based on pigment alone, some may be based on structure alone, but we really don't know anything really in terms of what generates a lot of these colors. We have a lot of ideas, some species may have uh, maybe some classification done, but there's still a lot of work to be done here, including the role of avian eye color. We really don't know anything about that either. Um, one other cool way to pigment avian eyes, though, and I bring this up because I thought it was super bizarre but awesome, um, is the idea that blood is used to color their eyes. A lot of your red-eyed birds, um, that is generated via the blood in their retina, shining through the tr otherwise transparent eye, thus giving you a red-eyed appearance. As such, they have some control over how red that eye is. And so. Very fascinating what that could be used for. Okay. <clears throat> I've talked a lot about rules of color. I've talked a lot about mechanisms of color. Now I just want to sort of end on a fun note um, about color, colorful things or weirdly colored birds you might see when you're out birding, right? I've never had the opportunity to see these, but um, color aberrations are very much out there when it comes to the birding world. 
this could be an entire presentation in and of its own as well. There's so many different ways um, color can go wrong when a bird is getting uh, growing up, right? Um, but I'll focus on some of the more obvious ones that you might run into. The first one being albinos. Albinos are a complete lack of melanin, um, and that means it's lacking everywhere. It's not in the feet, it's not in the beaks, it's not in the eyes. You'll notice that um, those areas actually appear red because that is the blood shining through the otherwise trans. This is as opposed to leucistic individuals, which can still look pretty white, but you'll notice that their beaks, their eyes, and their feet still retain that melanin. That's how you can tell them apart from albinos. And they may be fully leucistic, such as this uh, pileated woodpecker off to the side here. Although you notice that there are still carotenoids happening here. Albinos can still have carotenoids as well. It's just the melanin. Or they might be partially leucistic, such as in this American rock. There's only some speckled white going on. It's not fully leucistic. Um, but if you happen to see a bird out there that has some really weird white plumage going on with it, it's probably leucistic. Going the opposite direction, we have melanistic individuals. Uh, melanism is when there's like an extreme amount of melanin deposited in the feathers in places it shouldn't be, such as in this penguin. Unlike its counterparts that have very nice white bellies, it is completely covered in squiggly brown lines. Um, make it a really cool to look at, but you know, maybe make some an outcast in this flock. I don't know. You can also show up in flamingos, which is pretty cool. Um, imagine you're like looking at a flock of otherwise pink birds and you see a black flamingo. That's um, quite the extreme melanistic individual there. Okay. So before I go into the next slides, I first wanted to say thank you for listening to color the entire time. Um, <laughs> but I'm just gonna quickly highlight some of the color research done here at LSD. So I said a couple of times in the presentation, you know, we don't know, or we're still figuring this out. And I, but I wanna emphasize that we're working on it. Not just at LSD, but in other uh, institutions around the country and around the world. Um, so I'm just going to quickly highlight some of our research. First up is um, Roberta Conton. She's part of the Faircloth Lab. She is looking at blue crown mannequins, in the crown, but she's also looking at ultra black and lepidopterous mannequins. So she's one of the few people working in that field. Um, it'll be very fascinating to see what her research generates in the future. Anna Hiller is probably a familiar name to some of you. Um, if you've come to some of the tours at the museum, she's looking at color in the, through the lens of evolution, specifically in diglosa flower piercers, um, especially in their hybrid zones. So color plays a bunch of roles uh, in their sort of their hybridization, potentially in their species recognition. Eamon Corbett, if you've gone to any of his grackle presentations, he's got a lot of cool work on grackles and eye color in particular. I encourage you to ask him what he thinks about eye color being used to differentiate his species. It's a fun, fun answer. <laughs> but again, that color, that eye color slide from Pervious um, was all from him. So he's doing a lot of um, the pioneering work in the eye color field. So stay tuned, incredible research from that um, way. Next up is a postdoc from the Mason lab, Diego Ocampo. Uh, he has looked at color specifically in Sporophilus seed eaters, um, looking at it between sexes, sexes, within sexes, and how it might have evolved uh, through sexually selected traits. Um, very good researcher. He's done a lot of cool work, a lot of cool field work. Um, if you ever get the chance to meet him, it's got some good stories. Next up is Diego Cueva. He is another PhD student. Um, he is looking at a mannequin hybrid zone in Colombia. Specifically, he's looking at the hybrid zone between golden collared mannequins and white breasted mannequins, or white bearded, sorry. Um, and where they hybridize, they are showing intermediate color forms. So he is harnessing color to look at the, the role it plays in hybridization and speciation. They're very uh, hard to access hybrid zones. Ryan Klutz is another PhD student, or sorry, the master's um, working in the Brumfield lab, and he is looking at the hybridization between glossy and white-faced ibises, which if you've ever tried to differentiate them on site can be very much a pain. Yeah, he's still using color to like differentiate them, um, including the hybrids that they use.
Um, I mean, I can just say my answer. Or okay, yeah. Let me let me. Computer up there. <clears throat> For those of you um, listening on Zoom, we apparently Samantha lost uh, internet right at her last slide. So I'm going to move my computer up there so that she can answer questions from anybody. Um, and if you do have any, you can put them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them. Okay. All right. Um, make sure that I have some sounds so we can hear this. Yep. I might have to unmute my helmet. Well, no, I'm not on Zoom anymore. Right. Okay. Can everybody hear me um, on Zoom? Yes. 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 Okay. All right, so there was a question uh, yeah. from you. I was uh, particularly interested in the, uh, excuse me, what about our life with an owl and other things of night creatures? Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that a useful technique if you're out trying to burn at night trying to find owls? Or um, maybe, um, probably not unless they're in flight. So the question was uh, if you're out at night trying to find owls, would it be useful to use UV light to try and see if they'll um, show fluorescent pink? And the reason I say no is because most of that fluorescent color is in the underwings. So unless they're actively flying and you happen to shine your light directly on it when it's flying, you're probably not going to see it. It's usually hidden otherwise. So any other birds besides owls, maybe or like night jars have it, um, at least as, yeah, under the wings for the most part, as far as we know. Um, but you could try and see if other species are showing it other way. <laughs> elsewhere um but that'd be a different kind of spotlighting for sure <laughs> all right um any other a question so rodents so mm -hmm. um, the pink is from carotenoid yes so you have white ibis rodents spoon though essentially eating the same food but white ibis don't turn pink and rodents spoon do why do they turn pink and what advantage is there for being a pink bird okay. in nature yes all right the question was why are roseate spoonbills uh, pink when other birds, such as ibises, eating the same diet aren't? And what advantage would pink birds have in nature? So in terms of why some species have it and some don't when they're eating the same things, it all depends on the metabolic pathways in the bird that are there to you know, process that carotenoid and modify it to then deposit in the, the feathers. There's a whole process. You just don't eat it and get it to accumulate in their feathers or their skin. Um, it has to be. People say it's because they eat shrimp, and that's not it. It's no. because they eat it and process it in turn. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. That, so that, that yeah, they have the specific uh, chemical pathways necessary to transform that color uh, from the shrimp into carotenoids, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then in terms of why pink birds would have an advantage, it comes down most likely to courtship. As far as we know, you know, it's there are some thoughts, especially in carotenoids, that if you're red or pink or yellow, orange or um, that indicates that A, you're able to find more energy in food, which is a good fitness strategy uh, for a mate, um, or it just might indicate you're healthy in general, like you don't have anything degrading your feathers or affecting that coloration. So it's kind of thought it might be a, you know, a badge saying that I'm healthy and I can find food, but there's a lot of different. Um, doesn't have a no, that it does not. So there, there's a cost, there's a cost obviously to it, but it's thought that perhaps the cost of having a greater likelihood of reproduction outweighs that. So let's see if there's any questions in the chat real quick. Um, Nope, I don't see anything in the chat. All right, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I have a question. This is Terry. Um, the the oyster catcher. I was just looking at a picture. Those eye colors, they, they're like almost three different colors. Oh yeah. Uh, so do you know anything about that? Or yet is that one of the other guys is studying that? So that's kind of what Eamon is trying to figure out, but the short answer is we've got no clue why they have three different colors in their eyes, possibly for courtship. Maybe it helps them tell their ages. It could be, again, a badge of, you know, they're healthy. We just really don't know. Yeah. Eye color is kind of a black box in the bird world. There's not been a ton done there, but hopefully that's changing. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just really, really cool. I, your well, your slide brought that up, and I just happened to pull up a picture of one, and it was like, yeah, wow, that's really neat. That's pretty fun. 
Um, cormorant eyes are also fun to look at too. If you look at a neotropical cormorant eye or I want to say great crested too, they are also eyes that have two different colors going on in them. And it's quite strange to <laughs> see that on something in front of you. Um, yeah. Well, do you know why do the why do some of the raptors change eye color as they mature? Like I think like the juveniles and some of the raptors are yeah. one color. So the idea is that perhaps it's an indicator of what age they are. Um, and that might be important for them finding mates later on, but we really don't know. That's um quite mysterious eye color as of now. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for inviting me. Again, I love to talk about color all the time. <laughs> and if you're very curious about iridescence, if, if any of you ever get the chance to visit the museum and uh, have Samantha do the tour, she talks about the colors as you go through, and it uh, makes it really interesting. So, yeah. uh, absolutely take advantage of that if there's an opportunity. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Sam. And we will end here unless there's any questions or comments from the audience. Nope. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank y'all.